right. I have had a little disaster occur. Last night when I went to look for the notes for this talk, I couldn't find them. I looked at every sheet of paper that I brought along with me, and I have no idea where they are. No, no, I probably stuffed them with some other notes in a file cabinet. Yeah, I got that. Um, so, we're working without notes. And that means the talk is likely to be very brief. It's going to be very stripped down. Because when I make notes, like for one of these classes, it's usually between 8 and 12 hours composing the notes. And so there's an awful lot of uh, information that goes into it. And I can't skip this talk because it's a very important talk. So I'm going to have to do it extemporaneously, which means it may very well not be thorough, and uh, I may be subject to error, but uh, we're just going to go ahead anyway, and we're going to talk about <laughs> the desired world. That's a good yeah. If we return to our setting, and our setting is a human sitting on a horse next to a pine tree, next to a rocky butte. We've been going back to that image again and again and again. When we first looked at the image, we noted that there was something different about the horse and the human. The horse and the human were not connected to the earth. They were free, but could move out. So that made them significantly different than the other two members of the of setting. Yesterday, when we spoke, we, we spoke, even the day before, we spoke about having the energy to move around. But movement doesn't just occur by itself alone. There has to be something that stimulates it, something that motivates it. And from the viewpoint of Christian mysticism, that stimulation is done by desire. However, when we look at desire, we're no longer looking at something that is subject to the laws of nature, the physical laws of nature. There are a different set of laws we are on a completely different plane. In the Lucian uh, terminology, it's called the desire world. Uh, Paracelsus called it the astral plane, or the astral world. He did that for several reasons, because uh, it was that realm through which the star forces, the astral forces, worked into human and animal consciousness. And the second reason is because it was scintillating with light. It was rapidly changing, and it was like it was made up of stars. The word astral or astral world is not a good word anymore. It is sort of a garbage can term. term. It has come to mean a lot of different things to a lot of different people. And some people, when they talk about the astral body, they're talking about the, the etheric body. And they're not talking about the desire body at all. For this reason, the uh, brothers of the Rose Cross, when they gave the Rosicrucian teaching to Max Heindel, decided to describe each world by its function. And so the function of the desire world is desire, because desire is what motivates most people. So, if we're trying to experience this, we have to experience our own desires. More than our own desires, our emotions, our passions, our moods, all of those things are feelings. 
all of those things are manifestations of the desire world. So when we close our eyes and we turn inward and we experience emotions, it's a little thin. It's almost like a desert. And that is because in our individual desire bodies, we have not yet evolved much ability to emote. Most people only emote to the extreme desires. Sex, thrills, like you get in uh, horror movies or roller coasters or something like that. Anger, and some people have sadness, a muted Saturnian kind of desire. But when you read poetry, or when you listen to music, you realize that the poet and the musician can objectify emotions that we really don't even experience often, except in those artistic conditions. In fact, I think all of us should participate in art as much as possible to do that, because our inner, <coughs> inner emotional life is pretty much impoverished. We don't have much of a feeling life. And there's, there's nothing barring us except our own efforts. So the more we can feel things, the more we can emote in different ways so that we can be moved to do things, the better it is for us. Now the Rosicrucian <coughs> philosophy has rather unusual things to say about desire and the whole desire world. Normally, when we experience desire, we don't start from the bottom up, and we don't start from the top down. We come in somewhere in the middle of the desire world. Just as we saw in the physical world that there were seven planes, the solids, the liquids, the gases, the chemical ether, the life ether, the light ether, and the reflecting ether, there are seven subdivisions to the desire world. We won't name them now. I'll have to bring them to memory. <laughs> no, that's, but um, the central subdivision of the world of desire is called the subdivision of feeling. Now, the way the term feeling is used in Rosicrucian Christian mysticism is much different than we use it in the common parlance of the English language. In the English language, we say things like, we hurt somebody's feelings. Uh, that's not quite the way it's used. That word in itself, hurting someone's feelings, might be a blessing. Uh, Hurt is a kind of desire. If we cut ourselves, it's a funny thing, if we cut ourselves, the cut is perhaps in our finger. And it's carried, the experience of that cut is carried through the nervous system, through the ethers, but we actually feel the pain in the desire body. This is a very practical thing. It's a practical thing because when you're feeling pain, or you're feeling some other sensation that is extreme, you immediately have access to the desire world in a way that you normally do not, unless you are volitionally motivating. And so if you have a great pain or something like that, you can use that pain to uh, drive a really strong prayer. From your feeling of pain, you can ask for spiritual healing for someone else with that motivation being the driving force. It doesn't even have to be your own pain. Even if it's just a matter of compassion for, of, for the suffering of someone else, that feeling of pain and suffering for the other person, you can use that. You can use, the, to use the betters term, you can parlay that into something much, much more. 
So we enter in through the world, uh, through the realm of feeling. Now the Rosicrucian philosophy says there are two basic feelings. Interest and indifference. That's a very interesting concept in itself. Indifference is a feeling that's hard to understand. To my, my pondering on it, this is a personal statement, and it's not a statement of the Rosicrucian philosophy, indifference is something like a desire antimatter. Meaning to say, it cancels out real feeling. If you're indifferent about something, and there are emotions that you have, if you take the subject of those emotions and uh, treat it with indifference, those emotions eventually die away. That's not a good thing to do. There are some spiritual schools that cultivate indifference. And they cultivate indifference because they are aware of all of the treachery of desire. We all know the troubles we get in with desire. We're talking about health, and our health uh, is most often a result of desires. For a number of years, I had uh, health difficulties because I desired more food than was good for me. And when you do that, you, you get yourself in trouble. But the idea of being indifferent until you cancel out all desire, which is the goal of some schools, is uh, you become a great person. There's nothing to you. A person who has desires and emotions and feelings has color to their life. They have motivations to do things. Moreover, this is another one of those instances that to take such an action to deny a major segment of reality is blasphemous. In the same way that some spiritual philosophies say that the whole physical world is illusion and that we should uh, eschew the physical world and stay away from those illusions and head for the uh, spiritual worlds. Some of the Platonists thought that way. That's, that's, to me, that's blasphemous. The physical world is here for a reason. And we've taken many, many millions of years to evolve a body to do things in it. And the physical world is a wonderful proving ground for our divine, <laughs> excuse me, our divine creativity. Similarly, it is blasphemous if we, if we deny the desire world. Now, there are some times in life that practicing indifference is a wise thing to do. There are some times when there are incorrigible desires that cannot be tamed, and they are the things that will bring you near to destruction. Also, if you have to work together with people that have exceedingly, and when I say exceedingly, I mean outstanding, rambunctious desires, and any engagement with them at all results in some kind of a fracas of one type or another, sometimes the only thing you can do is to treat that situation with indifference. It's the only way that you can bring spiritual light to the situation uh, at all. So there is a function to indifference. But even though it's a feeling, to feel indifferent is a sort of a gray, sort of a nothing there kind of feeling. Or the other pole of feeling, though I don't want to use the word pole as in the sense of uh, an electrical polarity or something like that. At the other end of the extreme of feeling is interest. And interest is what causes everything to take place in the desire world. 
the seers tell us that an individual who is interested, you can always tell, or a person who has had a living experience of the desire world, you can always tell that person because their aura is brighter in the desire world part of it, not in the etheric part, but the aura is brighter with light. The aura is more alive. In everyone, the aura is very alive. But in a person who has had a conscious experience in the desire world, it's much more alive. And it's bright. Now, when you're talking about brightness and colors and things like that, you're talking about the outer effects. It is true that when you learn to see in the desire world, the shades of color are expressions of feelings. It, they are, you know, they are how we feel when we see certain colors in this world. But those are just the outer appurtenances. A person who has been awakened in the desire world has interest. There isn't anything that a person who is interested, that is awakened in the desire world isn't interested in. They're interested in this and this and this and this. This is why when you find great spiritual people, initiates, they don't limit themselves to one thing. They're interested in everything. They're interested in all the sciences, all the arts, philosophy, religion, anything. I remember the story once. Uh, a man came over from India that was a seer. He was uh, one of my friend's father's friend. He was a man of some note. And uh, he came through the offices of a building, and he had never seen a dictaphone before. Immediately, as soon as there was a lapse in the activity, he was there. He wanted to see what this was and how it worked. He was interested in it. Like most people come in and they'd be self-important, they'd worry about their own lives and, you know, what am I doing here and all of that. But when you have that awakening in the desire world, you're interested in everything. Now, the Rosicrucian philosophy says that there are two forces that work throughout the desire world. Let's take the positive one first. It is attraction. And at the other end of the spectrum, there is repulsion. Attraction is found throughout the desire world. Attraction is aligned with interest. When you're interested in something, you're attracted to it. You're drawn to it. So attraction is found throughout the entire desire world. Repulsion is only found with the lower or baser desires. Now there is a principle of how things work in the desire world. And it works on the basis of attraction and repulsion. But attraction and repulsion are kinds of actions or kinds of forces. And they need to be set into motion. And the way they are set into motion is through one of two attitudes. Now there's another principle that works throughout all of the spiritual worlds. It is a principle of inner and outer. For example, the more that there is something turning inward, in reaction to that, there is also something that goes outward. Now let's go into some examples in our lives. That it's the Tom Sawyer effect. You know, with painting the fence, when you get interested in something, you're, you're interested, that radiates out, and pretty soon other people are attracted. They're curious, and they come in. So, there are two ways, with two different attitudes, that the forces can be set into motion. The first one is self-assertion. And self-assertion in the not 
complementary use of the term. We say if a person asserts themselves, they are being offensive. And that is the use of the word self-assertion that we are meaning. Now, when you're asserting yourself, you're taking something to you. You're appropriating it. The best example I have ever found of how self-assertion works, and it's something that we've all seen. Take a dog at its feeding bowl. And there are other pets around, maybe other dogs, maybe some cats. The dog at the feeding bowl asserts itself. And he says, this is mine. He even goes further than that. He growls. And because he's taking it to himself, he puts out a radiation of repulsion. So, if you're interested in, all, in the astrology of all of this, the whole desire body that we have microcosmically was begun in the moon period. So the whole desire world and the desire body is ruled by the moon. And the moon is the feeler. It's sensitive. So the, especially the central region of the desire world, the world of feeling, is ruled by the moon. But the moon is also a drawing planet. But the lower desires are martial. In fact, one of the key words for the sign Aries is self-assertion. One of the key words for the other pole of Mars, the negative pole of Mars, Scorpio, is repulsion. So it turns out any time that there is self-assertion, it produces in that attitude a repulsive that goes out. I once did a talk on uh, Christian mysticism in the cowboy movies. And in that talk, I talked about the classical kind of cowboy movie where the bandits hit the gold, they rob the stage, and they head for the badlands. And when they get into the badlands, they begin to think, well, there's six of us, but if there were five, my share would be bigger. <laughs> and you know the story, how it goes in the movie, until it's two people, and then it's finally down to one, and he's starving to death. He's got all the gold, and the posse pulls up, and they don't even have to fight with them because they've done each other yet. That's the way the lower desire world works. Everybody selfishly wants it for themselves, and they assert themselves even to the death or elimination of someone else so they can have more for themselves. Desire is objective. It has to have an object. You have a desire, you have a thing that you desire, whether it is a desire to take that to you or whether it is a desire to give to it. And so, like, when, you, when someone asserts oneself, there is an, a, a repulsion that goes away and it pushes the person off. So gradually, this, this kind of thing actually happens in the desire world. Forces bring things together, and when they're brought together, if they're self-assertive, they keep fighting for the same object, and sometimes the object they're trying to destroy is each other, and things are disintegrated. Actually, the uh, lower desire world is the compost bin of the, uh, of the whole desire world. Because desire forms outlive usefulness just like physical forms outlive usefulness. And they are rotted away or disintegrated and the stuff of the desire world is liberated to be reused by the principle of uh, repulsion. Eventually, the repulsion tears apart all the forces. Now, the Rosicrucian Cosmo Conception gives very good uh, examples of how this can be used, or some of the terrible things that happen. Number one, it talks about why it's dangerous to lie. 
Because when you lie, you not only produce a false thought form, you also produce a false desire form. The true form and the false form are brought together because they're about the same reality. And then the lie dies. Eventually it has to die because it's not about a true thing. But it actually injures and in some cases destroys the truth. It's a matter that if you're a liar and if you lie about something enough times, you begin to believe your own lie. And so there is a maxim about the desire world that a lie is both a suicide and a murder. The lie destroys itself and it eventually dis destroys the, des the emotion that the lie is about. So the lowest region of the desire world is where most people function. They function in the region of coarse, sensual desires and passions. That's the only realm in which the repulsive forces of self-assertion are dominant. But that doesn't mean that the force of attraction isn't there. It is there, and it is there most certainly. If you ever talk to a sensualist, you'll find this. Uh, one of the strongest signs of the zodiac for desire is Scorpio. Scorpio desires everything, but especially sex. I worked with a young woman once, counseled her, and there was no way that she, this woman was ever going to be sexually temperate. And the reason was that she found the emotional experience of sexuality and the emotional experience of orgasm, she found them extremely pleasurable. She thought that heaven was perpetual orgasm. She never sustained any lasting relationships with anyone because basically the sexual desire, if it is manifest for self alone, is a form of self-assertion. I, you, you hear it, I want you, baby. Those are the words that are said. I want you, self-assertion. Consequently, uh, sexual passion is repulsive. It takes an awful lot of love in a relationship to be able to sustain sexuality. And if that love isn't there, uh, a partnership will rip apart because there gets to be what I call, it's going to be a little raw, there gets to be what I call an F and F syndrome. People are either fighting or fornicating. I remember one time, I had been living here at Mount Ecclesia for three and a half years, and I moved back to Wisconsin, and I was in an apartment with a thin ceiling. And there was a couple up there that were in the F and F syndrome. And it was terrible to me, because I'm, I have a lot of sexuality in myself, and at that, that age I had a hard time dealing with it. But it was funny. It was really funny. Uh, it was either Sam, Sam, you're killing me. Oh, Sam, you're killing me. Either fighting or fornicating. And it went on in such a fashion. But at any rate, this young woman realized, she realized that there was the attractive force of love, even in the course of self-assertive sexual desire. It's the way it works. All of the planes, it's, you know, the, the things about mysticism, whatever form it is, if there's a statement about the reality of it, you should be able to see it from your own experience. And I hope I'm talking about things that you have seen or experienced yourself. I know people that don't feel good unless they're angry. When they're angry, they're experiencing intense desire, but there's also a little feeling of love. 
sometimes some people don't think you love them unless you can get angry. Uh, I had a friend once, the first sweetheart I ever had in life, and she was really cool. She was an Aquarius, an extremely cool Aquarius, never seemed to get flustered by anything. But I knew she loved me because I was the only person that could get her angry. And I knew that in that anger, that despite the fact that she didn't like losing her cool, and that she didn't like the feeling of anger, she knew that in there, there was also love. So the force of attraction runs through all of the planes of the desire world, the subplanes. In most of the planes, the force of attraction is predominant. The attitude that sets in motion the force of attraction is sacrifice. Sacrificial love. When you love, you fill. And when you want to give, you fill up. Let me do this for you. Or let me help you with that. That kind of love, when you sacrifice, don't think about yourself. We've been talking about it in the Shakespeare uh, class at night. Last night we talked about two of the characters in the Shakespeare play that are healthy, very healthy individuals. When there's a crisis, their first thought is not for themselves, but for somebody else. And it isn't possessive. It isn't just instinctive mother love, because in, all, in both cases that we've been talking about in the Shakespeare class, there wasn't that kind of a tie there. It was just because they loved other people and they gave. Now that's tremendously attractive. Everybody wants to be around somebody that's giving off love. If you're giving of yourself in the most sacrificial way and you find something that you can help or just give the love itself, you have never a loss for friendship. There will be more people around than you can possibly handle. So you see that same inner outer principle works. In this case, in, in the case of repulsion, you try to draw something to yourself and it repels off. In the case of attraction, you're filled out of the fullness of the heart or out of the generosity of the heart. The mouth runneth over, as the Bible says it. You pour out and you give, and it attracts things to you. Uh, I have a story that uh, before I married my wife, she put a squeeze play on me because we had been together something like seven or eight years, and I wasn't getting around to marriage. <laughs> and I probably never would have. And uh, so what she did is broke it off suddenly and took up with one of my friends right in front of me. Now, she didn't consciously deliberate this. She's not a schemer. She just did it. And the effect of it, some people shoot from the unconscious. That's, that's the way they function in the world. And so she uh, took up with my friend, and uh, in doing so, you know, like, I was bleeding. When you form ties with others, you, are, you literally form ties with them. The invisible helpers will help you break the ties, but only once. But, you know, you're connected. When, it, when, when the Bible says, uh, a man and his wife shall be as one flesh, that doesn't mean physical flesh, that means etheric because the etheric bodies flow into each other. And part of you is left in your partner, and part of your partner is in you. And it's very much like hypnotism. In hypnotism, the hypnotist projects part of the vital body into the subject. And the same things happen in a partnership that happen in hypnotism. Because partners can suggest to each other. One thinks a thought, the other one picks it up. That's because part of their matrix is in each other. And because they're part of a matrix is in each other, they even begin to take the shape of each other. 
So they take on each other's facial characteristics. They take on, here, a lot of it is observation, but a good part of it is because they're interchanging vital bodies. And in that interchange of the vital body, uh, the form of one takes on the form of the other. So I was at the stage where I was bleeding in my vital body, and in my desire body I was hollowed out. You know, it was like half of me was missing. And so what I would do is I would go out about 20 miles out of town, is the end of the driftless area. It's the edge of where the glacier came down and it didn't come any further. And when you get there, the hills, instead of being smoothed off, are rugged. And there are a lot of ledges and things like that because the glacier didn't smooth them off. And I used to go, I got permission from the owners, and I'd go up on this big ridge, and there would be a valley coming in from this side and from this side and from this side. It was a beautiful place. And so I'm out. This is so symbolic as well as... Uh, it's, it's, it's spiritual. But uh, I'm sitting up there, and in the valley directly below me is a cornfield. And I hear a blatant mooing from the cornfield. And it's a kitten. And people, there are people that don't take cats to the Humane society, society, they just take them and drop them off by the roadside. And so I hear this kitten. And the kitten is obviously in a sad state. And the cat is a leonine creature, and for me it means lost love. <laughs> it has that kind of symbology. So there I go. I get a friend, and we go to the cornfield, and no matter what, we can't catch that cat. So what happened is I applied the principles of the desire world. Across the road... From the uh, cornfield was a little clearing in the woods, and I sat in the middle of that clearing. And I just loved the cat. And I heard the mewing, heard the mewing, and pretty soon a straggly little kitten, skinny, filled with burrs and everything else, and is crawling out of the cornfield, crosses the road, and it comes up toward me, and it circles around me, and around me, and around I don't do a thing. Because I know if I self-assert, the cat's going to be gone. I go around and around and around, and finally it brushed against my leg, and once it touched me, that was it. Then, then we were bonded. I could pet the kitty. I found a good home for it. But it's one of those things, if you self-assert, you push things off. If you just love, you attract things to you. In fact, that's the way animals work. Animals don't like eye contact, especially cats. If you want to be friends with a cat, and the time you're meeting that cat, you don't look at the eye, you look askance, and then it'll come up to you. All right, we're looking then at the principle of attraction and repulsion. I think we've covered that a little bit so we have an idea. We've talked about the region of coarse sensual desires. Now, the next region up is called the region of impressionability. And in the region of impressionability, the uh, repulsive desires and the attractive desires are about even. They're matched with each other. Now, that's important. That's very important. That makes the region of impression and impressionability a different kind of neutral. If one of the two forces was predominant, it would tear desire forces apart. If something, if the other were, if the attractive force were stronger, it would keep adding on and the form would not be stable. It would not be constant. So what happens in our consciousness, if we're living a rich life, we look at something outside of us, and we take it in through the sensory process. And when we take it through the sensory process, it goes in through the ethers, into the realm of impressionability. And it 
forms an impression. Exactly like the impression of impressionism in art. Sometimes the form can be made to look like the forms in this world, but in the region of impressionability, it is the emotional impression that we draw from what is outside in the external world. And that's a secret. An impression is like a memory. If you impress a seal into wax, that impression that is left behind is a memory of the experience. And in order for the impression to be true to reality, in the desire world, it has to be live. It can't be stagnant. So it has to have enough of the assertive force to keep itself alive. But it also has to be constant without constantly accumulating. And so when there is a balance between impressions, between attraction and repulsion, when an impression is formed, it lasts, and it lasts true to nature. It's an important thing. All of memory is like that, even the memory that is in the ethers. The ethers have to be subtle enough to receive the memory, and they have to be constant enough to hold the memory and keep it on forever. As we're going to see in future talks, if we ever get to them, here I promised you this one would be no long, more than a half hour long, and uh, we're going on 45 minutes already. I'm sorry for that. I just never short. Ah, uh, I have been on occasion. So the region of impressionability is especially important after death. Because after death, when we look at the panorama of all the experiences of everything that ever happened to us in our lives, they get impressed as the physical body and as the etheric body are going into disintegration, nothing is lost from them. And when nothing is lost from them, it is taken and impressed in the desire world. And in those impressions of the desire world, true to reality, are every desire you have ever had about everything in the world. Unless you retrospect and unless you change your ways, a lot of people are going to be a lot in a lot of trouble when it comes to looking at those impressions from life. Every time you look at someone with lust, even if you just ogle a young lady, you are putting out a kind of desire that you're going to have to cope with. So that's pretty much the function of the region of um, impressionability. The next region up, there is still a little bit of repulsion, but there is also mostly attraction. And it's called the region of wishes. When we wish for something, there's some degree of selfishness. We say, I want that, or I'd really like that, or wouldn't it be pleasant if that were for me? So there is that repulsiveness because you want something for yourself. You're not going to be authoritative because authoritation, authority is a really strong self-assertion. And when somebody comes on authoritatively, and I want you to tell me if I do that to you, if I come on real authoritative saying that this is the way it is, and I'm not explaining, and I'm, you know, that repulses people. But with a wish, it's just a, a faint amount of I'd like that. And from the viewpoint of humans, all of the lower regions of the desire world are important. And the region of wishes is important because we are not yet capable of doing everything by love. Therefore, in order for us to not have to be for us to not be for us to be not be without motivation, we have to uh, have something that motivates us. And so if it's a wish, wouldn't it be nice if I could entertain a lot of people and make them feel good? 
Now that's a mixed emotion. It's an emotion that you want to do something for people, you want to give something to them, but you also personally want the joy of doing it for yourself. You want to reap the pleasure of that. Now, so there's a little bit of self-assertion, but it's necessary because we can't do everything without regard to self. We're not that evolved yet. So for some people to have good wishes, like we just saw it on a lot of Christmas cards. I got a lot of Christmas cards that said best wishes. And that's something that is an intermediary kind of practical desire to keep us motivated that at least has a predominance of love and not a predominance of selfish self-assertion. The wishes are helpful in that way. The higher regions of the desire world are called the regions of soul life, soul light, and soul power. They are the soul regions of the desire world. Yesterday we spent most of the day talking about the soul regions of the etheric world and of the etheric body, the vital body. We said that the vital body, the, the soul ethers of the vital body are unlimited. We can get, make them richer and richer and richer. And the richer they are, the more conscious we are in the body and out of the body. There are special things that happen in the soul regions of the desire world, but some of them are very hard to understand. So first, let's talk about, um, let's just talk about the realms. The lowest of the soul realms is the realm of art. Again, Venus is the planet of attraction in the same way that Mars is the planet of repulsion. So when Venus gives, she attracts. But it's more than... Love isn't just crystalline. Love is flavored. Venus love is flavored. The higher altruistic Iranian love is... Uh, that's pretty clear. But Venus loves things, and she beautifies. So the lowest of the soul regions of the desire world is a realm of beauty. It's a realm where there is a motivation to make something wonderful. It's the realm of art. Now, most of us have pretty scanty desire bodies. Most of us do not have an emotional life. We don't cultivate and have living in our emotional being ongoing emotional, I don't want to say the word entity, we don't have emotional themes playing through us. I think for us as spiritual people, it's not just enough to not do wrong. We have to do some things that are right. And art is one of the things that can be done. The more we work in this region, the more we cultivate that life of color, that life of feeling. We should all be like the painters or we should all be like the musicians, that we have these themes. You see the themes if you follow the life of a painter. I go to art museums quite a bit, uh, California, Illinois, all over I go to them. And it's really nice to watch a uh, retrospective of a painter. You can see that there are periods in their life where one kind of feeling is predominant. And then they go through all kinds of um, morphic changes of that kind of feeling. And then they move on to another period. Uh, sometime I plan to do an astrology class 
a dynamic astrology class with the horoscope of Pablo Picasso because he had the blue period and the pink period and the cubist period and all of those periods where he stayed with a certain kind of thought but also a certain kind of feelings and all of the all of the pieces in that time have a tone quality about them and you know we should have a life of feelings that is independent it's absurd for us to think that we're going to leave the body and go into another world and not have cultivated something of that world if we haven't cultivated an understanding and an appreciation and an ability to create with the stuff of the desire world and we think that we're going to be able to go into the desire world and do something, we're sadly mistaken. Even if we were capable of doing so right now, if we hadn't cultivated an emotional life, we would face major disorientation. Uh, myself, I'm not very good at it. I've been cultivating it for a lot of years, but a lot of my emotional life is in prayer. I have a prayer life, and in that prayer life, it's amazing the different kinds of feelings and the different kinds of themes of feelings that you get, and you can build and you can cultivate that way. There's a certain amount of spiritual autonomy in that. If you haven't cultivated a spiritual life you don't have what the artists call a muse. You can't be wishy-washy and be an artist. Because if you start listening to everybody, they all mean well, they'll tell you what you should do next, and pretty soon your, all of your art will look like a collage, because it'll have the input of many people. But when you cultivate your own emotional life, then you have your own muse, and you can follow an emotion out through its end. You can take it through a full evolution, a full metamorphosis, and carry it to its logical conclusion, and that is your piece of art. Even if it's a flat, static composition. There is art, that, you know, invisible helpers, you know, like if we study for those Christian fellowship and we dedicate our lives to service, we are guaranteed the opportunity to serve as invisible helpers. And when we serve as invisible helpers, we do educational work. Uh, mostly we do healing work, things like that. But we're also educated to be made better. I had a friend that, uh, I guess, I guess he doesn't just have to say it with me, that had uh, a waking experience of art class in the inner worlds. And the art class in the inner world is not like it is here. You don't use a paintbrush. You use your consciousness. And to the extent that you are capable of holding a feeling and objectifying it, do you accurately get the tone, color tone that you want in what you're doing? But it's not like here in another way. Here you would never see two painters on one painting. But in the desire world, especially among the invisible helpers, everything is a matter of cooperation. And uh, so in an art class there, many people will be working on the same painting. It has a funny kind of dimensionality. And it's something like painting by numbers, but not that gauche. You understand that there's a composition, and you understand that you have a part in that composition, and it's yours to fill in your part and blend it in with what other, others are doing. It's one of the most humiliating experiences for me in life to wake up and say, oh my God, I did that. It wasn't so much that I didn't hold my uh, emotional tone true to what it was supposed to be. It was a matter of, uh, I don't know, let me split a little side trip on a side trip, I guess. Different spiritual groups have different tones for them. And the people 
that are attracted to them and stay with them do so because their tone is the same as that group. And so there are certain characteristics this lady has both with the group that has a characteristic of a supreme, delicate, pointed intellectuality. But the, one of the faults of that group happens to be priggishness, and it happens to be uh, some, not so much Kuzmu's tree, but a little bit of sophistry. There are other things. I don't want to talk about other people's groups. I'm not naming it. But uh, if you interact with other groups, you see those things. In the Rosicrucian Fellowship, those of us who are attracted to it, there's one quality that most of the people have. It's an intense kind of zealousness. The other side, the flip side of that is our self-conscious application to the path in our zealousness turns out as self-righteousness. And so what happened to me, I'm in the art class and I'm, instead of minding my business, I self-righteously want to mind somebody else's business. <laughs> I want to see how they're doing with the art, whether they're holding their end up or not. <laughs> so I was doing all right until I started doing that. It's a much different thing to keep the whole archetype in mind. If you keep the whole archetype of the art piece in mind, then you can work together with other people and it can be cooperative and the whole is there, but it's not the same thing as uh, if you're looking over to see what somebody else is doing. If you keep the whole in mind, you can take your part in the whole and you can even be aware of what's going on with the others. But if you get stick your nose in somebody else's business, <laughs> there must be a reason I have this big nose. <laughs> And I lead with it all too often. It's one of the things, the first of the regions in the uh, higher part of the desire world. Altruism is the next level up. Greater love hath no man than he lay down his life for his friends. The altruism of that region is not like the altruism of the region of life spirit from which, the, from which the Christ operates, that is a kind of love with a capital L that is almost unbelievable in its supernal beauty. It's an altruism that is more personal. It's an altruism where you have to have someone to love. You don't love the whole, you love each one in the whole. And so in the region of altruism, again, it's, it's a Venusian attractive region. In that realm, you learn to love the beauty that is in each individual. Now there's a danger in talking about the spiritual worlds and the way we're talking about them. And it happens a lot with uh, Western people are just too technical. I don't mean to say that Eastern people aren't. They haven't even waked up to the technicality yet, in many cases. But we're just too technical. Uh, some of us have been discussing the fact that uh, often in uh, modern Western mysticism, there is an appreciation of psychology, of the mythical stories that each of us is living out in our lives. And there is an appreciation of a lot of things in the inner worlds in a less mechanical, less technical way, but in a more spiritual way. We are materialistic. We are so hooked on the experience of seeing things in the physical world that we are not prepared to enter into the spiritual world yet. We're getting there. But the way altruism works, it works on a realization that each individual is a creative expressor of divinity. This, a desire body is not something like fabric 
if you sew a dress together or you, you sew a quilt or something like that, it is made of your emotions, it's made of your desires, it's made of all of your feelings. But it isn't even just that. We are God's in the making. And so what happens is that when we create, when we emote to the degree that we are altruistic, that is, our divine human characteristics are unfolded, the stuff of our desire bodies takes on that divinity. And with altruism, when you have a taste of love, you can see everyone and you can see how divinely creative they are and how they've taken the stuff of the desire world which was divine to begin with and have given their special touch to it. When you walk around, there are a lot of beautiful faces that you meet at a place like Rosicrucian Fellowship headquarters here. You see people that are bathed in light and people who, you know, they may not be profound intellects or things like that, but they've given their life in service. And because of that, they're fine spiritual people. And when you see them, you can't help but loving them. And it's you're not loving altruism. You're loving altruistically the creation that each individual is. The highest region is called is deals with philanthropy. Not Andrew Carnegie style, where you are tight fisted and make a billion or so dollars and then you make enough off the interest that you can give public libraries or uh, Carnegie Hall or whatever like that. But it's philanthropy where you love everything. It's just not an artistic love. It's not a human love. You're actually approaching divinity in the way that you love and you give yourself to everything. It's a wonderful kind of experience to experience that kind of desire. I can't say a whole lot about that because when you say a whole lot about loving everything would border on pretension we border on sacrilege. I think that all of us have enough reverence in us that I you don't have to be preached to by me. Mm. Each of us has our own individual desire body. And in the same way that our physical bodies are made of physical stuff, that we have taken from the world and made our own, our desire bodies are the stuff that we've taken from the desire world and made our own. The desire world is extremely astrological. Given the position of the planets relative to the backdrop of the signs and the constellations, the planets are pouring in desire material into the desire world all the time and it's constantly being recycled. So we have our choice of what we want to take. And it's as though we live in a very living paint palette. A paint palette that according to the way we feel that we take from the stuff that's around us and build into us. Now we talk a lot about astrology in this organization, but there is a kind of an astrology that's very spiritual that has nothing to do with horoscopes. If you look at the ephemeris every day and see where the planets are, you can see what's in the air. And it's like growing up if you see a child that's around 10 or 11 years old <coughs> when the vital body is forming, that child will look up to its elders as role models. 
If their father swaggers, they'll swagger like their father. If their mother likes to be coy, they'll try to be coy like their mother. To begin with, almost all of our creation is plagiarism. If you listen to a musician, I happen to like jazz music a lot, uh, even it happens in classical music, a musician for much of the career is first a result of everything they've heard in other musicians. Each musician has a voice, and you hear things from them, and then you repeat it, and in the early stages you can say, wow, I can play like Jimmy Jufri. You get that feeling, and after you play it like Jimmy Jufri for a while, you have that as part of your being. And eventually, as you mature, and you come into your own spiritually, you get your own... I haven't stepped off yet and broken an ankle or something like that. In order to communicate with people, you have to be open. And often you have to be humble. And I do all sorts of awkward things unconsciously. And the result of it is there's an open bond that is developed with other people. And these ironic things keep happening all of the time. Another name for cause and consequence is irony. It's poetic justice the way everything happens. But at any rate, you get your own voice. And we can get our own voice with regard to the gods. Looking at the ephemeris every day is like looking at a musical score. Or it's like looking at a color chart except that it's temporally relevant. You know what's in the air now. And if you want to live a healthy emotional life, there are certain things that are available at certain times. We see them in fads. We see them in intellectual directions. You know, they're manifest. People don't even know they're living out the astrology of the times. But they're taking the stuff of the times, and they are what they are. But as spiritual students, we realize that there are many ways that those paints can be used to paint an emotional life. So by looking at the ephemeris every day, we can take into our desire bodies and create with what's available. We can attune ourselves we can plagiarize from the gods. It requires some imagination. We can inwardly try to feel what each of the planetary positions is or what each of the aspects is like. And then we can play make-believe. And we can develop an emotional life that way. And we can create something. Not only do we get the stuff, but we get the purpose. We all know that there's a purpose in each of the times that we're going through. Historically, we live in a very purposeful kaleidoscope. And so that's what we do. Our desire bodies are what our feelings are. Now, in the desire body, there are total sense organs so that we can see Yesterday we talked a lot about sense organs and sensation, saying that in any given spiritual world, you can't really operate until you can objectively perceive that world. But the desire body, as fluid as it is, emotions change rapidly. You cannot, if you try to follow like you follow with your eyes what's going on in the desire world, you won't do it you'll be confounded almost immediately. You have to look with a different kind of consciousness. You have to be aware that there are moods within which there are all kinds of desires that go on. There are moods, you know, sometimes you're grouchy for weeks on end, and there are ups and downs and all kinds of little emotions in that, some of which you go, you know, like you look at some people's faces, and 10 or 20 expressions will go across the face in a matter of seconds. That's nothing compared to what's going on in the desire world that changes all the time. But in the desire world, the sense centers are vortices. 
Now, we can't think about the desire world the way we think about the physical world. It has an inward dimensionality. And if we think about objects in the desire world the way we think about objects in the physical world, we'll see them that way, and they will be true, but it will be limited. There are inner dimensionalities. So what happens is that in the desire world we have these vortices. And these vortices are concentrations of desire stuff. And the desire, it's like they're like, you know, just like going down a sink drain. And the concentrations are such that the material goes down the drain but into another dimension and it comes out through the great vortex. The great vortex is at the liver. The other vortexes are at the end of the forehead, the back of the head, at the voice box, at the genitals, and at the knees. Now, some people have consciousness that is forward-looking. Some people have consciousness that is positive, that they can do something about destiny. It doesn't have to be a self-centered destiny, self-centered doing something, but they know they can do something. Other people are more receptive. Even animals. Animals are completely receptive. Animals, even in aggression, don't do the aggression themselves. They have a group spirit that's moving them. So the animal, in an animal, the whole emotional nature is received from the group spirit. Now there are some human beings, well all creatures are receivers. All creators are givers. In all of our whole evolution coming to the present, from the Saturn, the Sun, the Moon, in the first half of the Earth period, we have been creatures. All the rest, we are going to be creators. When Christ says it is better to give than to receive, he's not trying to break up the equal poise of cause and consequence for action and reaction. He's putting an admonition before the people saying, all along you have been receivers and the gods have taken care of you and given you everything that you need. Now, when the Christ lives in you and you come into your own, in your own self-being, now it's better for you to be a giver. When Christ says it's better to give than to receive, he means that. Now, the people who are still receivers and people who do not have a gumption and people who do not have control of themselves and have that forward-looking thing, in them, the vortices spin a different direction than they do in someone who is positive. It's a tricky business. Uh, the rotation of the vortices is described many ways, but I find the easiest way to remember it is it's as though something goes up to the right and comes around and around and around. If you're deeply involved in concentration or if you're deeply involved in prayer, you can actually see the pinwheel form in your forehead. If you are deeply, deeply involved, you can actually feel the vibration as the physical etheric bodies are accommodating themselves to the uh, desire world. And if you go further yet, uh, as it's described in the exercises, it's as if there is a little hole that is something like a motion picture screen and you see things suspended in it. So if it comes up the right and down the left, that's an involuntary person. But if it comes up the left and down the right, that's somebody who is in control. Somebody who is in control has what in the Orient they call the diamond in the lotus. There is a brilliant, brilliant light at the center of the forehead. So we're constantly recycling all of this emotionality in ourselves 
The same principles that are in the desire world are in our desire bodies, but each of us has our own peculiar psychology of how we bring that to work. Now, this isn't anything probably like what I would have done if the notes were there and it was intended, but this is going to have to be sufficient for now. We'll probably do a little more on the desire body tomorrow and the desire world and get in at a few more usable things. I hope that in all of these talks, I hope that we're trying to get at things that even though we may not be clairvoyant, that we can experience it in things that we do every day and that we can take the principles and use them because if mysticism is anything, it's practical. It's practical in the highest sense because it helps us to participate in the grand creation and to go along with the principles of evolution and cosmology and live the right way. I hope we had enough examples. We're going to come back to the desire world in a number of cases when we talk about things like what happens after death and things like that. But for now, let's close with the Rosicrucian prayer. Oh God, increase our love for thee so that we may serve thee better from day to day. Let the words of our mouths and the vision of our hearts be.